Okay, good evening everyone. Hello, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Elizabeth Maddow. I'm an assistant research professor here at the Eagleton Institute of Politics, and I'm the director of Eagleton's Youth Political Participation Program, and we're really pleased to see all of you here. Um, it's my pleasure tonight to get to introduce our guest speakers. Um, one quick reminder before we get started, I do believe we're taping, to please um, remember to silence your cell phones. I was going to make a crack that this will be especially difficult for the technologically astute millennials in the audience, um, but I think it's challenging for all of us, even if we're not millennials. So for someone like me, who dedicates her career to understanding and encouraging the civic and political engagement of young people, it's with some trepidation that I confess, oh, someone didn't silence No, no, no that is <laughs> okay. silencing. Okay. <laughs> was that a millennial? No. Okay. <laughs> that, that, that was a GI great generation. <laughs> it's with some trepidation that I confess to be a member of that self-absorbed generation of notorious slackers, Generation X. Um, or, as one group of scholars referred to my generation, the poster child for poor citizenship. Um, <laughs> Perhaps it's because I come from Generation X that I look at the millennial generation, uh, as tonight's featured speakers do, with such awe and with such hope. As they will tell you, and I frequently tell my students and the young people with whom we work, America's youth has the potential to, to remake the future of American democracy. The, the size of this generation, their diversity, their technological savvy, their education and their outlook offer the possibility of greatness. Their commitment to civic engagement and volunteering, even in tough economic times, exceeds all other generations. My job, our job here at Eagleton and beyond, is to ensure that their political involvement mirrors this civic engagement, as it did most starkly during the 2008 campaign, and that they fully realize their potential as democratic citizens. Lower case C. <laughs> Perhaps our guest tonight will shed some light on that quest. Marley Winograd, I'm sorry, Marley, Morley Winograd is a senior fellow at the University of Southern California's Annenberg Center for Communication, Leadership, and Policy. He served as senior policy advisor to Vice President Al Gore during the second term of President Clinton's administration. Michael Hayes is the former vice president of entertainment research at the communications firm Frank and Maggot Associates. In their new book, Millennial Momentum, How a New Generation is Remaking America, our guests will sketch a picture of this generation for us and explore how today's young people are going to transform America's future. I imagine it will give even Generation X slackers, such as myself, some, some hope. So please welcome Morley Winograd and Michael Hayes. Thank you for that very kind introduction. The uh, 2012 election is going to be one of those elections that occurs about every 80 years that really remakes American life. And we're going to talk to you about this. Uh, the politicians recognize this. This is just a statement from the President of the United States saying that this election will be a slugfest between Republicans who don't believe in government as a partner with the private sector and Democrats who do. We're going to have 16 months in which we debate this vision for America. And that's the operative phrase, really, is the last, vision for America, because that is what this coming election will be. Uh, this is one side of the aisle, one side of the picture, but it, it, if you would talk to Republican nominees or Republican candidates for president, for example, uh, uh, or John Boehner, the Speaker of the House, they recognize the crucial nature as well. So it isn't just the president of the United States, but, but his opponents who recognize this uh, equally well. Um, really what we are going to be talking about in this coming election is the America's civic ethos. What should be the scope and purpose of government? Why do we have government in America? What does it do? What, is, what, are, what, are, what, what do we expect of government? How does it operate? How do we evaluate it? Every 80 years, the country tears itself apart, and that could be in a literal sense, as it happened one time, but it could also be in a in a, uh, a, a figurative sense, trying, trying to answer this question. The first time it happened was at the very beginning of the United States. Uh, during the period from 1783 approximately to 1789, the Revolutionary War. 
we had a bunch of questions to answer. The country did. It wasn't even a country, really, at that point, or an independent country. But that was one of the questions. Where, where, how is America ruled? Uh, are we English, or are we something else? Are we some new breed, Americans? Uh, are we ruled from London, or are we ruled from our homeland? Uh, what are the relationships of the various colonies to one another? Now, are there any relationships? What, are the role, what is the role of individuals? What do people get to do? What is the right of the governed versus uh, the government? All, all of those questions arose uh, and eventually was resolved. Well, all of these questions were eventually resolved. Uh, we became an independent nation. Uh, we tried uh, a loose confederation of states, the Articles of Confederation. That didn't work particularly well. So then we went to a more centralized form of government that was enshrined in the uh, Constitution and, and, and it, that required a Bill of Rights to make sure that we could pass the Constitution. And this is what we are governed under to this very day. Uh, so that was the first of these great debates that resolved, at least for a period of about 80 years, what America was going to be like. But that wasn't the end of it. <clears throat> In the mid part of the 19th century, we went through the issues again. And a lot of the same questions were raised. What was the relationship of the states to the central government? Did the states have independent powers that were separate from the federal government that allowed them to uh, uh, make all the laws that they wanted to do and the federal government didn't have a lot to say about it? Uh, what in particular was the, what was the position of non-white people in this in this, uh, in this United States. There was a Supreme Court decision that tried to resolve that, the Dred Scott decision, which not only said that slavery could be legal in every single state in the Union if a slave was moved from a former slave state to a free state, but that in fact black people could not be citizens of the United States. They might be free, but they couldn't be citizens. They couldn't even sue in the courts, really, and that's what Dred Scott had done. That was, it, that was the kind of questions that were being raised. Uh, that, that literally, in the most literal sense, tore the country apart. And the issue was decided on the fields of battle from 1861 to 1865. The consensus that was worked out came, was worked out in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which outlawed slavery, which said that, in fact, federal law was going to be supreme at that point. But it was a very incomplete change, because by 1876, there was an election in which the Democratic candidate won the majority of the popular vote across the country. There were electoral votes that were disputed in four states, and they reached a political compromise that would put the Republican presidential candidate, even though he did not win the presidential election, into office in return for federal troops being removed from the South. And that basically denied the the, uh, all of the rights that have been proposed and, and, and ratified in those three amendments for another century until, until, the, eight, until the 1960s. Uh, so it was an imperfect uh, solution, but nevertheless, it did resolve some important issues. And finally, in, uh, it, starting in 1929 with the stock market crash, we had our third great debate of this kind. There certainly were issues over what is the role of individuals compared to, uh, in, in contrast to government, but it was also the big issue that needed to be resolved was what is the role of government in the economy? Does government have any role in the economy? Uh, is, is, does government have, have anything to do with protecting the, uh, the economic rights of, uh, and the economic status of individual citizens? Uh, the New Deal uh, generally resolved that issue and, and it came and enshrined the conclusion that in America, the federal government did have some broad responsibility for guiding the economy, for trying to keep as much economic stability as possible, and also creating a floor, at least, under which people could not fall economically. That, that they were, there was at least going to be given a minimal standard of living, a minimal uh, set of economic rights. Uh, but it took, again, you can see, about a, about a dozen years for that whole thing to be resolved. Well, we're now beginning our third, our fourth period where we are going to have such an election now, uh, and, a, and a decision that has to be made. Every time these events begin, they begin with what we refer to using a business uh, uh, acronym as fear, uncertainty, and doubt, or FUD. The country looks at the old order. It seems to be falling apart. It doesn't seem to be working particularly well. All the things we believe 
uh, we don't believe any longer. There's a lot of recrimination, a lot of division. Does this all sound kind of familiar with what we're going through today? And that's really how all of these periods begin. If you look back at the Revolutionary War period, and we think, well, everybody was a patriot, and we all marched out and we got rid of those British, and it wasn't that a great thing. Not true. Uh, we don't know. We don't have public opinion. There were no public opinion polls then to, to ask the question incessantly. But it does appear that approximately a third of the people living in the colonies at that time were, were patriots, were rebels. A third were loyalists who were in favor of the British crown. And a third were kind of on the fence and would go either way. More people, more loyalists, left the United States after the war, after the Revolutionary War, than French royalists left France when they had their revolution about 20 years after, or about 15 years after ours. So it was a divided country. People were against one another. There was no total agreement. Even when the war was won and, and the colonies were now the United States of America, there was disagreement over the Constitution. If you listen to people in the Tea Party movement talking about this being a God-given document that has come down, it was a political document. People had to argue, they had to fight. Uh, I don't know how, exactly how New Jersey voted, but I know your neighbors to the north in their state legislature, the vote was by one vote to ratify the Constitution in the New York Assembly at the, at, at the time. Uh, Massachusetts was divided, Virginia was divided, all the big states were divided, so it wasn't an easy thing. They had to compromise by putting in the Bill of Rights to make it palatable enough so that enough states would actually ratify the Constitution. It was a very political doc doc document. And this has gone on in all of these periods of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And it takes about a decade before all of this is cleared up and we go to a new set of ethos. What really is happening is that, as you can see, the old lion is fighting the new lion, the young lion. The, the new generation's ideas, in this instance it's the millennial generations, are being resisted by those in power. And for the most part, those in power today are baby boomers. And we'll, more, more we'll talk a little bit more about some of these generations as well in a moment. But that's what you see. You see the millennial generation, and we're going to show you poll data that shows they have very different attitudes from older generations in the United States today. Compromise is very difficult to achieve in this arrangement, but ultimately what we have is a new synthesis of what we refer to as America's, or actually we didn't refer to it, the President of the United States referred to it, America's political DNA. Um, American public opinion and American political philosophy is kind of divided. There on the one hand people feel, well, we have individual responsibility, we have individual rights, we want limited government, all of those things, but we also believe that we need to have collective action. We need, we need, there are times we need to work together to achieve a common goal for the good of all of society. So you have these things that need to be balanced, individualism versus collective action. Whatever at any particular time is the division that we have, uh, that ends up being the, the latest version of American democracy. Americans have a, this is from polls, Americans have a split political personality. Uh, this book, actually, that this data came from, was actually published by Rutgers University Press uh, in 1965 or 66, Marley. This was a, a, by two authors, Free and Cantrell, in 1964. They used Gallup poll data to demonstrate that American, Americans, and this is each individual, this isn't just one group of people who are liberals and one are conservatives, but Americans as individuals are, are, have conflicted points of view. So on the one hand, they are operationally, or programmatically, we prefer, liberal. They believe in government programs, but they're also uh, ideologically conservative. They believe in small government. They believe in individual rights and responsibilities. In 1964, as the New Deal era ended, uh, with, the, with Lyndon Johnson's landslide victory, it was the last hurrah for the New Deal era at that point, 65% of Americans were programmatic liberals, Based on this survey, only 14% were pro programmatic conservatives. So they believed in specific government programs. On the other hand, 50% were ideological conservatives. They believed in a bunch of statements that had to do with individual freedom, liberty, responsibility, and so on. Uh, a few years ago, using a Pew Survey Research Center data, Morley and I calculated, uh, the, the questions weren't the same, so you can't compare the, the results exactly. But nevertheless, the same basic pattern existed that existed in, the, in, in 1964, starting in 1987 through the 1990s into, the, into this decade. Americans, greater number of Americans were always 
operational or programmatic liberals, and the greatest number were also at the same time, same individuals, uh, ideological conservatives. So we have this balancing act that is, a, that is a very much a part of American life, uh, at least we know since the 1960s, and actually we're pretty sure it would have existed long before that. Again, combining individual freedom and national commitments, and what we are trying to do, this is what the new arrangement is going to be, uh, in line with the new civic generation's beliefs and behaviors. Now we've used the term like the civic generation, so let's talk a little bit about what a generation is. Generations, and that's the foundation of our book, and Worley will talk in great detail about the millennial generation in a few moments, but is the aggregate of all people born in, within a 20-year period uh, of, or one phase of life. So they're all born, first of all, in one period, so they share a common location in history. They're all people, they, they, came, they, they were born, they come of age together in this one point in time. Surveys would indicate, this isn't astrology, this doesn't say, well, if you're born in 1943, you have a particular mindset, you're, the moon's over your head in a certain way or something like that. It isn't saying that at all, but it does say that if you look at surveys, people born during these periods of time tend to have common beliefs. The majority tend to believe one thing or another. Uh, so, for example, uh, it, 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 there could be characteristic beliefs as to whether people succeed through hard work or whether they succeed through luck. And those things can change from one period of time to another. So common beliefs, common behavior. And finally, there's a sense of common membership in a generation. Uh, we ask people, how many, well, I'll ask you, how many people in this room consider yourself to be baby boomers? So, you know, people know that. They have a sense that's what they are. How many, I'm just I'm curious, how many people would say you're millennials, you're the newest generation? See, and, and pe people do. And, and how many people are like Morley and me, members of an older silent generation, something like that? Okay, so there, there you go. So common, we, we all kind of know where we fall in this thing. Uh, these changes are created by different uh, child-rearing approaches. America, and really the Anglo-American world, it's, it's, a, it's the only place in the world, uh, perhaps, where people disagree from one time period to the next as to how you should raise your children. The kind of the rule of thumb is, I'm gonna raise, I don't know what the best way is, but I'm gonna raise my kids differently than I was raised. Because I don't think I was raised in the best way and I'm gonna try something else. <laughs> now, are you surprised when that happens that the children who were produced by this and raised by that way act differently? So, um, Events experienced during maturation, uh, big events like the Depression, 911, uh, the, the, the Great Recession, all of these things will obviously shape a generation's attitudes. And finally, changes in communication technology. I'll just mention one thing about that. Every 40 years or so, we have a change in how people communicate with one another. The big change that has occurred now is we have moved away, regardless of whether it's radio or Broadcast television or cable television, those are all kind of broadcast methodologies where there's somebody in the center talking to people out there. There's one person who decides, or one group of people who decide this is what you should hear. The new method is social networking where people, it's very de democratic, small d democratic. People are communicating with one another. There's no one person or group of people decide this is what's true, this is what you should hear. And that is going to make a huge difference in American life. All right, now this is my favorite part, because I get to talk about baseball. Um, I just want to illustrate how the different generations have behaved in American life by looking at a few baseball players going back to Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth was a member of a generation called the Lost Generation. Uh, generational theorists call, say that is a reactive generation. It's like Generation X today. Uh, a lot of the people and the children in that generation were, were, were raised at a distance from their parents. They were not particularly wanted by their parents at all times. Uh, they ended up being a kind of rugged individualist in many ways, entrepreneurial, but also there were, there were a variety of behavioral patterns. Uh, the baseball historian Bill James referred, not specifically to Ruth, but to the players of his era, that lost generation, as a generation of thieves, um, shysters. Sh thieves, shysters, and con men. <laughs> that was his, his, the way he described it. There were people like Ty Cobb, who was very much reviled. Shoeless Joe Jackson, who threw the 1919 World Series. Ruth was a much nicer person than that. But Ruth was still, he was, his father was a bartender. His mother disappeared fairly early. His father was a bartender in Baltimore. 
didn't, very lax uh, um, parenting. Ruth spent as much time in the St. Mary's home for wayward boys as he did behind the, uh, the bar at his father's bar, uh, which is near where Camden Yards in Baltimore is located today. And he was a great hitter, but he was a womanizer, he was a boozer. Uh, there was one time where he, he missed a week of games because he decided that he needed to eat 25 or 30 hot dogs in a single city and got so sick he couldn't play. Uh, that was, again, relatively typical. Ten years later, another guy was born in the Bronx, I believe, Lou Gehrig. Different generation, played, for ba played with Babe Ruth. Uh, he, Babe, he came up with the Yankees in the mid-1920s. Very close German immigrant family, very loving. His, he, he was, his mother was probably the strongest influence in his life. Uh, he, he was devoted, thoroughly devoted to his, to his beloved wife. He, could, he was an optimist, he was upbeat, he was positive. You, you all will remember, most of you will remember the Gary Cooper movie where I consider myself, as he's dying of, of ALS, I consider myself to be the luckiest man on the face of the earth. A man is dying, six months later he's dead, but he probably was sincere about that. His life had been wonderful and he was, he was very happy. The fact that he was a, a, of an immigrant generation is very typical. This is, by the way, a civic generation player, the GI generation, very typical of those kind of generations. He was a, a child of a German immigrant. Hank Greenberg was a child of Jewish immigrants. Stan Musial was a child of Polish immigrants. Joe DiMaggio, the child of Italian immigrants. And we can't forget about Jackie Robinson, who integrated Major League Baseball. All of those were members of this generation. Bill James, who called all of these guys shysters and con men, said these were wonderful team players, and they were skilled at their job. It was an 10 years later, and they become, and the kind of players became totally different. Hank Aaron is a member of our generation, a member of the silent generation. That's a, what's called an adaptive generation, very good at mediating between generations. Uh, Hank Aaron was silent in a lot of ways. During the civil rights turmoil, it was not that he believed in segregation or anything, you couldn't call him Uncle Tom, but he didn't want to get into the struggles. He didn't want to talk about it. He said, I'll let my bat speak for itself. And it did very well, but that was, again, fairly typical of that era. The next is, is a member of what's called an idealist generation, uh, Nolan Ryan, a baby boomer. He is the only one on this chart that I know whose politics are. I don't know any of the others, whether they're Democrats, Republicans, I know nothing about them politically. They didn't talk about it, but Nolan Ryan is a strong conservative. He is the owner of the Texas Rangers now. Uh, he is a friend of George W. Bush's. You see the Bushes attending ball games, sitting next to Mr. Ryan very frequently. What made him idealist was that he believed very strongly in this set of beliefs, personal beliefs, drove his life. He started playing with the New York Mets. He ended up going to the California Angels in Anaheim. And that wasn't good for him because he wanted to be back in Texas where his roots were, where he could live and raise his family in the proper way. And on the coast, it just wasn't so good that way. So he, he engineered a trade and ended up going back to his beloved home of Texas, again, driven by those internal values. Then there's another member of the uh, uh, reactive generation, Barry Bonds. Not surprisingly, that all of the steroid usage came in this particular era. The free agency where players moved with impunity from one team to another. Again, a generation driven by its individualism, not by team play. Finally, the civic generation, the millennial generation, going back to the same generation of Lou Gehrig. We've chosen Dustin Pedroia of the Red Sox. The reason I chose him, there aren't many, many. There, millennials are just starting to come into baseball now. But the reason I chose him was because of, of strong team play. First of all, he got along very well with his, his, his former manager, uh, Terry Francona, uh, as of last week. Um, and I know I'm in Yankee territory here, so I'm in real trouble. But he got, he, he, uh, he got along very well with him. It's like a father figure to him. Dustin Pedroia is, 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 is part Hispanic. He represents that wave of new Hispanic ballplayers. But the team play is really e exemplary for, for him. He, when he played at Arizona State, he gave up his scholarship so the team could hire, or not hire, but recruit pitchers uh, to get into the College World Series. It's exactly what happened. You wouldn't find very many Generation X players, for example, being willing to do that. So that's just a, a, a capsule of how different generations act in different ways and can really dominate a society and, and, and give a different cast to society. So I will now turn it over to Morley, and he can talk to you about the next civic generation, the millennial generation.
Thank you, Mike. I hope we're not uh, blocking the view here, so instead of sitting there, because then those folks can't see it, sit in the chair that I pulled kind of backwards here okay. over here. And did I stay out of your line of sight okay? okay. All right. So um, we, Mike's given you two critical pieces of information. One, that the country is being torn asunder by a time period not unlike other previous time periods in which the old way doesn't work and people are unsure of which way to go forward. Some arguing that we should go backward to more tried and true uh, times that seem safer and more comfortable, and others arguing that we should go forward into a yet unknown future, and generally that's being argued uh, by younger people uh, in the nature of things who are not in power. And then he sort of gave you a sense of the tensions that might exist between the generations in power, some of those boomers and, uh, and a few Xers, uh, and, and some leftover silence. Uh, and, um, and then this contrary uh, kind of generation, the civic generation that, that like Lou Gehrig and like Dustin Pedroia, have come along about every 80 years at the time when this period of FUD is in fact raging. And one of the reasons that the tensions are so strong is that the generational differences, as Mike said, are so clear and distinct. So just to make sure you get a sense of what, how this all might come out, and I'll conclude my remarks with a sketch of a future civic ethos that might come out of this particular period, we want to first set the context of the beliefs and behaviors of the generation that will dominate the American population going forward as this decade of debate plays itself out. So this is the typical way you think about millennials, if you've read any of Strauss and Howe's books. They're special. How many special millennials do we have here? <laughs> okay. Um, they know they're special because their parents told them so. Okay. And, um, and they're also, because they're so special, they've been sheltered. Uh, throughout their lives growing up, even, even today. Uh, we have this big youth safety movement, Amber Alerts, all that sort of thing, but also, you know, a little bit over the top stuff on you can't play outside by yourself because somebody's going to come along, I'll never see you again, and all, all of those sorts of things. Even though we actually live in some of the safest environments in the country's industrial history, that doesn't stop parents from organizing play dates that are always supervised. Um, and then they're confident because as my Gen X kids have told me when I am helping to take care of my wonderful millennial grandkids, no matter what they do, it's a nice job, right? It's, uh, <laughs> if grandpa says something that's a little bit critical, I get yanked out of the living room. That's <laughs> um, because, because obviously the whole point of educating a young person is to build up their self-esteem. This world's a terrible place. There's plenty of hard knocks ahead. The only way they're going to survive is to have all the self-esteem that you can squeeze into one young mind at any one time. And that makes them very confident. And, and, and then, then, of course, the world proved that it was true. I mean, they elected the President of the United States, and he was the first African-American president in our nation's history. So what more do you want? We can do anything. OK. Uh, Team-oriented. Um, I'll do a test with millennials here. Last time I asked this question, every hand went up, but it doesn't always happen that way. How many millennials watched Barney growing up? <laughs> so for those of you who either were too old to do that to your kids and put them through that, or uh, went ahead and sat them in front of, the, if you're a Gen Xer, you sat them in front of the television to watch Barney, but then you ran out of the room so you didn't have to watch. Um, Barney is a purple dinosaur, as different on the outside as he can be, but on the inside, he's just like you and me. So uh, <laughs> that's where all that tolerance came from, right? <laughs> Extraordinarily tolerant generation. And of course, Barney had a set of politically correct friends, each one a different type. And then they would run into a problem. And then the episode was they solved the problem. But it was very important that at the end of that solving of the problem, it was good for everybody. It worked out in a, what the business folks would call a win-win way, right? Whereas boomers are really into winning and losing and who's right and who's wrong and 
I'm, my team's better than your team. Millennials don't do any of that. Everybody gets a trophy. Nobody wins. It's, 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 it's all fine. And they bring that kind of consensus decision making into the political arena, into the corporate arena, into institutions of every kind. We talk about all those institutions in our book and how this kind of consensus team orientation will play out. We won't have time to get into how well behaved they are. Trust me, they are. There's almost no social index measurement except obesity, which is going in the wrong direction. Everything else is going in the right direction. The only social stats that are going in the wrong direction are when you ask it about people over 50. So the boomers are still at it, but the rest of us <laughs> have moved on. Um, pressured, push to study hard, avoid risk. This is one of the potential downsides of the generation, is that since life is a series of hurdles to be jumped in order to be successful, I've got to get in the right kindergarten, otherwise I'll get off track on grade school, and then I'll never get into high school whose grades are accepted by the college I want to go to. Okay, so with that kind of life in front of you, right, the notion of failing is like total disaster because you almost can never recover once you're in the failure fell off once. So while millennials can handle group failure and the team together trying something and not succeeding because we can then all figure out a better way to do it, individual failure is very difficult to handle by millennials, which is the exact opposite of Gen Xers because we always like to make fun of Gen Xers, but they are terrific entrepreneurial risk-taking folks. They've been that way since they walked into an empty house as latchkey kids and had to get done on their own. And so we see that as one of the real tensions between the two generations when you get boss subordinate relationships between Xers and millennials. The Xers can't figure out two things about millennials. Why won't they ever take a risk and why do they have to do everything together? Neither one of which Gen Xers want to do. Okay, and then last, and this also throws people because of the tolerant nature of the generation, they're a very conventional generation when it comes to social rules. They were raised in households who adopted uh, Bill Cosby's uh, method of raising kids that they watched on his show in the Huxtable family. Mother and father both involved. No physical discipline, but lots of rules with consequences for not obeying the rules. If you didn't do something right, there was a consequence. Five minute timeout, three year olds is how about three minutes, and we're into negotiations. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but the argument is never over whether there should be rules. And there still is no argument for millennials about whether there should be rules. So unlike Gen X, one of its slogans is no rules, right? <laughs> millennials in the workplace say, oh, I, I agree with that rule. Now listen, when it doesn't work out, I think that we ought to do it this way. What are you, I mean, you just got here, you know? Uh, but no, that's just a negotiation with a parent. It's perfectly okay. And that makes them a very good generation to have in society because you don't have to go to the fundamental question of why do we have rules, but the political debate we're having is what rules should we have. Okay, and the other thing you absolutely notice immediately besides their facility with technology is the diversity of this generation. It's 40% non-white, the youngest members of the millennial generation approach 50% non-white. Uh, the country obviously will become a majority minority nation as this trend continues. But it's also unheard of in the history of the United States to have this level of diversity that millennials are quite comfortable with, grown up that way, don't really think much about it, don't, they don't need to think about diversity as some of the older generations do because it's just inherent. It's also a generation that's the children of immigrants. Mike mentioned in his baseball tour of generational cycles, the, the children of generation nature of the civic generation of the GIs. They were, of course, children of ethnic European immigrants, and this is a different kind of immigration, but one out of five of millennials is the child of an immigrant parent. And so they bring that experience of when they think about uh, things like immigration policy, because we're talking about their parents. They're also the most gender neutral uh, uh, generation that we've ever seen. They don't believe that there are distinct roles by, determined by a person's gender. Uh, almost 90% of them disagree with that idea. And as a result, in many ways, they've become a female-driven generation. These are some numbers. You can read them in terms of uh, uh, higher educational attainment. A uh, majority of students in colleges, we notice that all the one in the room tend to be female, um, are, are majority female. And this just is forecasting their likelihood of attaining degrees as a proportion of the population going forward. This also leads to kind of interesting issues for males in this generation because 
a lot of the jobs that will be available for millennial males have traditionally been thought of as female jobs like nursing and teaching. Now millennials don't see that that way and you'll now watch if you go to elementary schools and look at the Teach for America volunteers, they're just as likely to be men as they are to be, fe as be women, but it is a different society in which those occupations are treated as not gender specific occupations. Okay, so what about their attitudes? Well, a lot of it goes to the nature of how they were raised by all the parents of millennials in this room, so let's see what you've done. Um, <laughs> uh, by a two to one margin, this one people sort of gathered and understand now. By a two to one margin, based upon that tolerant nature of the generation, as I think we talked about, they favor gay marriage. The older generations, which are in red bars on that chart, are the opposite way with 50% opposed to the notion of gay marriage. And that's sort of a common social issue measurement that people use to look at that tolerance level. Here's the one on immigration. Remember I told you how, how much of an immigrant generation it is in terms of their parents and their, their thoughts about immigration. Pew asked, all these are from March 2011, Pew researched unbiased, not politically or affiliated with anything, and, uh, and more current than the stuff in the book because of the nature of the publishing industry, but uh, we have similar data in the book. So uh, on the growing number of immigrants threatens traditional American custom values is the choice over here on the left, and the choice that Pew gave people on the right was that the growing number of immigrants strengthen American society. So does it threaten or strengthen society 26% of millennials thinks that it threatens traditional values. 69% think it strength, immigration strengthens American society. As you can see, Americans, other than this generation, are about evenly divided. A slight tilt to the immigrant heritage of this country towards immigrants strengthening American society, but nowhere near the three to one ratio of a millennial uh, survey research generation. Uh, they also believe in an activist government uh, so that these numbers are, in fact, exactly reversed. The question is, do you favor smaller government with fewer services or bigger government with more services? Millennials, by a 54 to 39% margin, would favor a bigger government with more services. The older generations would be exactly the opposite. So when we talk about a civic ethos debate in this country, a lot of it revolves around this question. And you can see where the millennials come down versus others. Um, it, this notion of teaming and working together as a group extends to their attitudes towards foreign policy uh, issues. This one is around multilateralism. Should the U.S. take account of the interests of our allies, even if it involves compromising? That's the key phrase there on the left. And on the right is, no, 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 the U.S. should follow its own national interests, even if our allies strongly disagree, didn't say it in the question, we have to do what we need to do for the country. So millennials are 64-34 on the side of multilateralism and taking into account the views of our allies, only 49% of the older generation of the public think so much more tendency to uh, think maybe we ought to go it alone. And therefore, when asked, what is your ideological orientation, uh, millennials are the only generation that mention the word liberal more frequently than they mention the word conservative. 29% uh, of liberals, 29% of millennials said liberal, 27% said conservative, Obviously, moderates in the middle got the biggest vote, but look at the step nature of the red generation, older generations behind it. Only 20% would mention the word liberal, 41% would mention the word conservative. So a two to one ratio in older generations and a statistically basically even split among millennials on the question of ideology. Whatever those words mean, which of course for individuals mean different things when asked about it. And then here's one of these things that tends to last a lifetime in terms of partisan identification, those years of maturation that Mike was talking about. Um, when asked um, by Pew the right way, are you a Democrat or a Republican? And if you answer you're a Democrat, do you strongly, do you have strong identification with that party, similar if they said Republican? But when asked if you're an independent, well, okay, you're an independent, but when you vote, do you tend to lean Democratic or lean Republican? And then you put all the people who said lean Democratic over with the Democrats because that's how they end up voting and all the lean Republicans over with the Republicans. You only get 9% independents left. Now I know for those of you who studied the election results and pr predictions on CNN, you would find this startling because independents are supposed to determine the outcome of the next election, but they're 9% regardless of generation, right? And in fact, when you ask them, these are the least informed, Less, least likely to vote part of the electorate you can find. 
And a lot of the reasons they say they're independent is because they have no idea what the Democratic <laughs> or Republican stand for. So whenever you hear a uh, pundit announce that independents will settle the election, turn the television off, watch something somebody knows what they're talking about, <laughs> and move on. Okay, well with that little uh, side lecture, on the generations themselves, millennials 52% lean or say they are Democrats, 39% lean or say they are Republican, and that is an interesting margin, about 14%, uh, not quite as large a margin as the actual vote for President Obama, which was 2 to 1, but nevertheless 52-39, and then on the older generations, almost an even split, slightly Democratic, 47 to 44, but about an even split. For those of you who wonder how that translates into the current presidential campaign, when CNN did a survey a couple weeks ago and asked the questions about Obama versus any of the, I don't know, half a dozen or so um, Republican candidates at the time, they didn't mention Herman Cain, so this could be irrelevant by next week, but um, uh, they, uh, they did ask and then they broke it out by generation and millennials were two to one in favor of President Obama just the same way they voted in 2008. Uh, obviously the rest of the country wasn't, so you get little different results. All right, so why is this so important? And we could have shown you this at the beginning, but we thought we'd focus your attention and concentrate your mind by putting it towards the end, civic ethos answer to come. This is the percentage of adult Americans, those over 18, uh, who uh, in, the, in the population, as the different election years come along, you can see the blue bar, which is how many of them have turned 18. So the whole generation will be 18 by 2020, by the end of this decade. Which means that in 2012, about one out of every four, 24%, of adult Americans will be millennials. Doesn't mean they'll turn out in the levels required to maintain that percentage in the actual vote, but in terms of eligible voting, that's where they are. In 2008, they were both 17% of the eligible electorate, only 40% of them had turned 18, and 17% of the actual vote. As many millennials voting as senior citizens last time. We don't know if that's gonna happen this time, but there's their potential. And by 2020, more than one out of every three adult Americans will be millennials. So all those ideas and beliefs and behaviors that we were just talking about will be the predominant belief of people who are living as adults in America within this decade. And that is a startlingly different country in its ideas and opinions than we see today. And it will continue to change with some disruptive nature all of the institutions that we are so familiar with and which we talk about in the book. So let's conclude and, and take your questions by going back to the civic ethos. Remember. Even among millennials who are a more liberal generation than previous generations, nevertheless you see this American uh, schizophrenic attitude towards politics. Uh, you know, conservative ideologically in terms of individual initiative and limited government, and at the same time interested in government-led action to address the specific concerns. So I know everybody makes fun of the Tea Party, you're saying keep your hands off my Medicare, but that's actually what this slide suggests is a very common opinion in the American electorate. So the way you get to a civic ethos that lasts, be it as strong as the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, the 13th and 14th, 15th Amendments, which took us about 100 years to make true, uh, or the New Deal, which, which wasn't even challenged when Eisenhower finally uh, you know, elected a Republican instead of a Democrat after the years of, of uh, Roosevelt and Truman, he didn't try and undo the New Deal consensus. We don't have anybody challenging the New Deal consensus in American political thought until today. And that's you know, one of the tenets of the Tea Party is the New Deal was a bad idea. And, uh, and so that's a different, but right on time, kind of civic ethos uh, question. So we gotta find a new way of putting individual responsibility and collective civic action together if we're gonna find an effective way to run American democracy in this century with a brand new set of realities when the old rules don't work. We think, and we say a little bit much, maybe much more about this in the book, that the answer will be a millennial answer. There are other ways of doing this. We had a gentleman at the Manhattan Institute earlier in the week tell us it was gonna occur through a humanistic libertarianism. When he gets that figured out, we'll all find out what he meant. But, um, but we think, because of the nature of the millennial 
a weight and unity of belief in the population, then it will look something like what a millennial would put together. Now, millennials have an interesting combination of pragmatism and idealism. Boomers are all idealists. They're all working towards their ideas. If you disagree with their ideas, you're wrong. They're right. We got all that going on. Um, uh, Gen Xers are pragmatic to a fault, right? Bottom line, tell me how to get it done. I'll do it myself. If it's not working, we'll try something else, but it's, the proof is in the pudding, all those kinds of things, is, is a generational X approach. Millennials think that pragmatism is really important, that, it, that doing stuff, as the president likes to say, is an important thing, but it ought to be done for causes. It ought to be done for things we believe in, not just for the sake of doing it or for necessarily making money. It ought to be both pragmatic and idealistic at the same time. Uh, it's a common thing among civic generations, and in fact, it's been at the heart of many of our civic e prior civic ethos resolutions, but it is also true of this generation. And the way they tend to go about that is to think about solving national problems or even changing the world by undertaking local initiative, uh, individuals collectively at the local uh, level taking initiative. So instead of thinking about a national top-down movement to change the world, they would think about starting something potentially in social networks that involves people who believe the same thing and then going out on the weekend and doing something about it. So both idealistic and pragmatic. And therefore, we think this notion of collaboration combined with individual empowerment will be the two strands of American political DNA that you will see in public policies and programs and the way we arrange our democracy. Not a bureaucratic solution to all of this, which is you know, sort of a New Deal uh, idea of the civic generation. You put the experts in the center and they tell us what to do and everybody does the same thing. Millennials are all for consensus. They're all for doing the same thing, but they want a lot of choice at the individual level on how to do that. Bureaucracy is not going to appeal to them. But that's, that's sort of the ideological conservatism side of this new synthesis. The other side of it is we're still going to do things collectively. We're going to have mandates and guidelines, the individual mandate in the health care bill is just the first of those kinds of things. And then we're going to leave it up to the individual to figure out how to successfully implement those mandates. Okay, that's our thoughts. We'd be happy to take lots of questions. Of course, you could always read the book uh, and even buy it. Uh, thank you very much. So whoever's going to get a question, ask, ask, speak it into the mic. This is one of those intrusions of modern technology. They're actually recording over there. You give out the mics. We're not going to, you decide how you want to do this. You got a gentleman up front who we're generationally sympathetic with. Okay. Uh, and then maybe you can go from there. Uh, right, right now, is this on? Yeah, oh boy, is it. Right, right now, the president is going around the country pushing uh, the American Jobs Act. Mm -hmm. And, and co clear, clearly, th this is an effort to swing the country back toward uh, perhaps the ideals of, an er of an, uh, certainly his generation, and perhaps an earlier generation. Where does this uh, millennial uh, uh, generation that you're describing, where, where would your statistics or your predictions go as to how that's going to work out in the next couple of years? I can start. Okay. Um, I will start and Morley can conclude. Uh, looking at the data that Morley presented, um, it, it is very clear, I think, that, that millennials would favor that kind of governmental action. They would, they would not be willing to just simply rely on, the, uh, on business, on, you know, as Republicans refer to them as job creators, who aren't creating a lot of jobs, I guess, but nevertheless, as individual entrepreneurs, laissez-faire, leave the, leave the hands of the government off, but they would, they would want to try to figure out a way of, have, of got involving government in, 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 in this procedure. Now, there are, you know, uh, that's, just, that's just simply because of, of how millennials are. They, are. they are believers in governmental activity. But what we would probably expect is that they will try to, they would also favor some way of trying to, of, of implementing a lot of these programs as best they can at, at the local level to, to the extent that would ever be possible. Uh, I think you also have to look at this generation, which has huge unemployment rates, as you might expect, 
So it's obviously something of kind of existential importance to them. They would, they would like to, uh, they've, they've graduated from school with large debt and then they can't get jobs. So they, they do believe in that kind of affirmative activity on the part of, 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 of government. They, they, they will not be, uh, I, I think, compelled by let's just let's see how, how everything works out and let's see how, how individual entrepreneurs operate in this regard. And I, agreeing with all that Mike said, of course, the other half of the Jobs Act, the one that seems to be more controversial, because even infrastructure problem, projects at the local level would appeal to millennials, is, of course, how do you pay for it? And, uh, and the, so now the challenge to the president is, does his tax programs or those of the Senate Democrats reflect an attempt to institute class warfare? Uh, and millennials have a very strong uh, interest in economic opportunity and equality. And so they also, in the polling data, register strong levels of approval, not just for the president, uh, but also for those specific ideas of progressive taxation and, and affirmative government activism. So now you will go this side of the room, then we'll go that yeah, side of the room. I was going to see if we actually also had maybe a millennial question. Well, that's all right. We they a, they already know what I had to say. That's <laughs> right. Just within the last oh, two weeks, a movement has started and which seems to fit all of the parameters mm -hmm. that you have just described, age-wise, organization-wise, everything else, the Occupy Wall Street. Yeah. Thing that's happening and it's just just literally started. Yeah. I wonder if you'd comment on that in terms sure. of how it fits what you're describing. Sure. So, like any other nascent movement, of course, you don't know where it's going to end up, and there's and you're sketching out opinions on things that may change over time. But we have some in some perspectives to bring to that question. We're going to call it OWS for those of you who aren't into acronyms on Twitter. Uh, uh, Occupy Wall Street is too long a phrase for anybody to put on a tweet. So, um, so um, there's several things. First, uh, the, if you haven't heard that, you know, there is some kind of declaration that's been issued at least by the group in Manhattan, uh, which sounds a lot like the Declaration of Independence. When in the course of human events, the da 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 is the Declaration of Independence, they list a series of grievances indicating why they're protesting. Uh, and so, you know, we said, oh, civic generation, that's who wrote the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson was a member of that civic generation. James Madison, who outlined the Constitution, was a member of the civic generation. Okay, here comes another one. But then, it's not quite so clear that they're into institution building or developing structures that would actually make something happen uh, beyond the protest. And while you correctly indicated, gee, it sounds like that bottom-up local action stuff you talked about, one of the things that um, many millennials understand and many more will learn is that in this world of social media, the online organization needs to be accompanied by offline action. And so far, OWS is almost all offline, very strikingly not online, very hard to find the Facebook group that's strictly OWS. There is a wonderful site on Tumblr, I know not all of you are in Tumblr yet, but it's coming, uh, uh, called 99% and that's kind of their slogan and that has a little bit more online, but basically it's not been organized in a very millennial way and that may be one of its downfalls, we'll have to see. Mike and I had the privilege of sitting around a lunch table at a college other than this one, which won't be named to protect the innocent, uh, <laughs> but they were all millennials, eight or ten of them, and Bef while we were out getting our food, they started in a conversation about OWS, and it was quite fascinating. Now, the, it's a little bit of an upscale college, so it's maybe not a representative sample, though the requisite diversity was certainly seated, seated around the table. And just a few comments, and Mike, you might remember more, and you can conclude these, this answer. Um, uh, the first young lady that we heard talk about it anyway said, well, I, I really can't go down to Wall Street. They were obviously in the neighborhood. Uh, I can't go down to Wall Street because my father works on Wall Street, and it would embarrass him. Now, for you boomers in the room, if your father worked on Wall Street, that'd be the reason to go down to Wall Street, right? That would be the first thing that would come to your mind, right? But uh, millennials, no, 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 they love their parents, wouldn't do anything to embarrass them. Um, another young man, kind of preppy, uh, said, um, well, uh, I don't think it's safe there. So we talked about sheltered nature of the generation. 
high degree of concern for safety, 9-11 a, a searing event in their young lives. They want to work in a safe place and if they're going to be asked to go to a place, they want to know it's safe. So he wasn't going. Uh, the guy next to him was the thing that proves this isn't astro astro astrology. He was an anarchist and a libertarian and he thought the protests were great. He'd been there and blah, 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 blah. So he was egging his colleagues on. Even though he was for Ron Paul, he thought it was really <laughs> great. <laughs> he was a Ron Paul uh, delegate, right? Or, he uh, active. And he was going. And, and he was been there. He thought it was and cool. He, he was going was again cool. and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, uh, and then the next one, um, uh, well, I don't remember the sequence, but it, eventually they got around to the notion that, um, you know what these people really ought to be doing? They ought to be voting. Uh, <laughs> how come they're not exercising their rights that are there in the system, okay? So a very conventional way of thinking about change, you work in the system. And again, for boomers, no, the last thing you do is vote, you go protest, you go on the streets. No, no, that's not where these guys are. Now, the interesting thing about this, and Mike may remember more of some of the specific conversations, there wasn't a single millennial around the table who thought the cause was wrong, right? They had a consensus that this was the right thing to be protesting and concerned about, all their disagreements were over how to go about the pragmatic side of the idealism question. How do we go about doing this? How do we make it work? How is this going to come out? And you know, us listening to it said, well, this is not a done deal. This is going to be interesting to see how this works out. Did I leave anything out of that? Long not a time? lot. I think to just kind of summarize it, it was really a matter of, again, total agreement with the goals of what the, the protesters were believing in, but still a real willingness to, we've really got to organize, we've got to work between within the system, we've, there are mechanisms that we can make the changes that we need to achieve as a generation and to achieve the goals of this, but that is, 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 is again working within the system, trying to build the, inst use the existing institutions or build other institutions. They kind of saw these folks as anarchists and that isn't a good thing. Maybe for some boomers it might have been a good thing because you destroy the evil, immoral institutions that are oppressing hum humanity. For these young people, yeah, the institutions are, are pretty bad, but we can use the institutions at some point to our benefit, to the benefit, and by our, I mean society's benefit, to the benefit of everybody in this society. So we have elections, and we will need some sort of capitalist system. It just needs to be made to work in the interest of more people. And so we will, uh, Morley mentioned economic equality. Uh, we will have higher tax rates with this generation coming along because that, but we will not destroy the capitalist system. FDR saved the capitalist system in a lot of ways, but he also spread things out, equalized things a bit. And I think that's really the way this generation was looking at it. So the These kids were looking at it. Final chapter on OWS has clearly not been written, but the outcome is in doubt. It's not clear which way it's going to go because it's not clear that millennials will be allowed to run it. That's another issue. Okay, so now we haven't done that side of it. We'll go there. Hi. Um, one thing I feel is needed to solve these big problems is leadership. And if you just think about what's, you know, the recording of Steve Jobs speaking to the Stanford graduating class in 2005. So one of the Pretty biggest, inspiring, huh? Yeah, everyone was. They keep on repeating it. Right. But one of the biggest things that uh, the best, one of the best things in his life was getting fired from Apple. Yes. He, that he would not have been the person he was if he wasn't free from leaving there and thinking again outside the box. So you just think of the tutors that are hired for this Riverdale history course and people, parents going with their kids for their Merrill Lynch interviews. Yeah. I mean, this, you know, and all this consensus yeah. in Barney. Yeah. I just don't, there has to be a leader. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so. And, then, and the other thing was, I feel a lot of what you said could be international, like well, the Arab Spring. It's not just the U.S. Well, you want to do the leader piece or the Arab Spring piece? <laughs> um, dude, uh, I'll start with the leader thing, but then we can get, because we have something said about international, and that's a great question. It really pretty much comes up in every one of our discussions. Gee, does this work elsewhere in the world? Uh, the leadership, uh, I think it we will not know precisely what the leadership style of this generation, we can guess, will be, because they are not in the position to be leaders yet. They lead themselves. I mean, they, they interact with one another and lead their own groups. But in terms of societally, we don't know yet. Um, but there have been other consensual generations 
that work together as groups and, and develop their own style of leadership. Uh, the GI generation, the greatest generation. I mean, we, you know, we had, I think, probably more GI generation presidents than any other generation in American history, starting with JFK and working all the way through a George H.W. Bush. So this long string of, 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 of presidents that came out of that generation. Uh, it, it, and they developed their own leadership style. I think what we will see is a more consensual style of leadership. It will be people working together, not top down, but kind of bubbling up and maybe leaders that will develop for individual projects in some way, individual causes, rather than you know, like one leader who's sort of uh, in the center telling people, an expert, this is the way you should handle things. I'll let Morley comment beyond that. Yeah, so you're not going to see a Steve Jobs out of this generation. That's not them. He's of an earlier, different generation. Um, and he could handle failure and he could be an innovator, you know, because his parents didn't love the way millennial parents loved him. So, uh, so you're just not going to see it. And, if, and, you know, you can say, oh, what are we going to do? And all that sort of thing. And it's an open question. But Silicon Valley is a Gen X creation. It's not a millennial creation. A lot of millennials work in there, but not innovating. Uh, innovation from millennials tends to come in social arenas, social entrepreneurship and those sorts of things. It comes tends to come from team effort, not from individual effort. And as Mike said, the leadership style tends to be consensus oriented as opposed to charismatic. Now, we do have two experts on this subject if you care to pursue it after our conversation. They both work here at Eagleton Institute. Ruth did studies on it, Elizabeth's doing studies on it. They've actually interviewed millennial leaders and they know lots about it. So I'm not gonna comment further for saying the wrong thing. Okay, um, and, and then, uh, then on the Arab Spring side, uh, we do talk about foreign policy and all the generational things in the book. Um, uh, there's several problems when you try and take a theory like generational theory and export it to other cultures. Remember Mike said that the American culture and even English culture is we raise our kids differently than we were raised. That's the theory of child rearing. That's as far away as we got. Um, but that's not true of a lot of very traditional cultures where kids are raised for centuries the same way. Well, there are no generational differences when that happens. Now, modernity is spreading to more parts of the world, and that breaks up the tradition. So now you would see, for instance, in China, from the Mao's Long March generation all the way to today's little emperors, a series of distinct generations coming along as, as parent-child rearing habits break apart from the traditional uh, way that Confucius taught and into something more modern. And um, so there's that issue. And then if you go on the European side, even though that's obviously a very modern culture, there aren't any young people. The mo most, you know, in Italy and Russia are dying populations and replacement rates in Europe just aren't there. And, and so many of the young people who are there are from a different culture who have immigrated and they're not integrated yet as you would in America. So, so you, don't, you don't have the numbers to make any difference in their society like millennials do. There's one place on earth besides here where the numbers are clearly there, and that's in the Middle East. And so we return to the Arab Spring. 50% of Egyptians are under 30, 70% of Iranians are under 30. Uh, huge young populations. However, that doesn't mean that they've experienced the same events. Remember, the other half of that generational thing was not just child rearing practices, which haven't advanced very far from traditional ways in the Middle East, but they have. But clearly the experience they've had are not ours, you know. And, and so when you look back, you see something similar to our cultural revolution of the 1960s, the Arab awakening of the 1970s, pan-Arab nationalism started to spread, and Nasser and others got a lot of support from, from their populations. And so that's about a 10-year lag. If you apply that 10-year lag under a wild assumption that all this makes sense to do, um, it would make the people who organized the Arab Spring, uh, the young people who did so, Gen Xers, if you were looking for an American equivalent. Not that they are Gen Xers, but they're of that reactive generation. And then when you look at the chant that's now spread throughout the Middle East, which is down with the regime, that's an Xer slogan, tear down the institution. It's not a millennial, going back to OWS, it's not a millennial slogan, uh, we want to build this, right? That would be something that millennials might say. So what we talk about is the possibility that while this 
X-like generation in the Middle East is, uh, along with their technologies, uh, clearly a major reason why this has occurred when it has occurred, and to the surprise of elites. It may be their children and or their younger siblings who actually build the new institutions of the Middle East after a period of a great deal of turmoil trying to figure out what those institutions should be. And I'll, I'll just give you sure. the one example, the one, it's, it's a sample of one, so it's hardly perfect. But the, the thing kind of, the event, this, the event that really got this going, really personified it, was of course the tragic event where the young man in Tunisia, the fruit seller, vegetable vendor, burned himself alive. He killed himself not because he wanted to create the new Tunisia, but because the government was messing with his life. He, all he wanted to do was earn a living. He was an entrepreneur. He was selling vegetables like a, a, a Gen Xer would sell vegetables, trying to do what, just make a living, and the government wouldn't let him do it, and he felt, I, if they just leave me alone, I'll be fine. Uh, but they're, they're oppressing me. He wasn't out again to start a whole new uh, uh, a political process. And, and so that is, I think, a good kind of one person example of how this generation of, of, of people in the Middle East is, is really responding to this and what they're doing in some ways. Now, at the risk of going on too long, the equivalent of the fruit seller in, in Tunisia, for those of you who enjoyed the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off, <laughs> right? If you'll recall at the end of that movie, Ferris's uh, boy, best friend, boyfriend, Cameron, they, the Ferrari isn't going backwards on the wheels, right? And so it's on a jack, and he's kicking at it and complaining about his father loving the car more than he loves him, all of that very classic Gen X conversation. What's he saying? I have to take a stand. I have to take a stand. Even, by the way, as he's very cleverly kicking the jack stand so the car ends up in the river. But the fact of the matter is that even though this powerful scene goes on to climax the movie for mi at least five minutes, you never know what his stand is. All you know is that he has to take a stand. That's sort of the Gen X solution to the problem. Okay, enough of all that. And now I think we're back to the center here. And then we'll, I think there was a guy, uh, Randy, there's, there's somebody here who's had his hand up a long time, but we'll go here first. Yeah, when, we, when I saw you here last, which was... Did we, did we contradict of, ourselves? I hope, <laughs> okay, good. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. This okay. was in the spring of 2008. Yes. And you were talking about the rise of the Gen X, the millennial gen, and they're starting to vote. And I got this distinct impression that you were going, that you were predicting that the Democrats would win mm -hmm. the election. Distinctively so correct. Are you doing any predicting? Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had uh, the great pleasure of being asked by Rutgers University Press to write a afterward to the original book, which is available in paperback. And as we told Marley, well, okay, we'll take about 9,000 words and say we told you so. So, <laughs> you know, that's how we wrote about it after the election. That's easier. So you got your predictions ready for 20? Well, I, 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 I'm not going to be go right out on the line and say, gee, it's a, it's a, well, a well, first of all, you can't, because Marley told us never to make those predictions. Right, <laughs> yes, and she's there, and she won't let us get away with it. But I would, so let's just talk about what might have to happen to go one way or another. You saw the last chart Morley put up, or one of the last charts, about the stair step and how important this generation is. Uh, I think the millennials will still be very decisive in this election, but they have the potential to be decisive. But there are two things that are going to balance this out. One is, will they continue to be unified as they were? In, 19, in 2008, they voted more than two to one for Barack Obama, 66 to 32. Again, judging from that most recent, it was about a week ago, CNN poll, they're still going that way, that, by that margin, over, the, uh, over any of the Republican, potential Republican candidates. So that is the, on, the, on the good side for President Obama and the Democrats. They still remain Democratic by a large margin, and that is persisted in spite of the, 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 the difficulties that they are facing. They remain optimistic. They think the President is trying to do the right thing. They, 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 so in that sense, they, they tend to be supportive of the President and, and of his political party. That hasn't changed a great deal. The bigger issue that the Democrats face is, can they can they, what is, first of all, what is the rest of the electorate going to do? In, in 2008, 
uh, the non-millennials, the older generations, divided roughly evenly. They were slightly for Obama, but not much. If, if, if millennials hadn't been in the electorate in, in 2008, uh, Obama might have won by one and a half percent, maybe two percent. Uh, overall, he won by seven percent. Millennials accounted for 80 percent of his popular vote margin. So that was, that was what happened then. We don't know how the older generation is going to go for sure, but they don't seem to be as quite as positive for, for President Obama as they were uh, even, even to be evenly divided. They may not be evenly divided. They may move in a Republican direction, regardless of who the Republican nominee is. I don't know. Uh, but it's the, so then you come down to the, the third factor, which is what is the equivalent turnout of these generation, of the, of the various groups within the electorate, and again, focusing on generation. If millennials continue to vote two to one for the, for the president, and turn out at roughly 24%, so they, they, they comprise 24% of the electorate, then that gives the president some margin to, 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 to uh, help him uh, keep office. But if that 24% drops into the 20%, 19% range, it isn't as good as it, as it was, then obviously the president's in trouble. So I think it, it's a matter of maintaining millennial solidarity, but also making sure that millennials are asked to vote, contribute to the vote. And that will, I think, be the really decisive story. So we did a little survey research work while we were here tonight. We walked to the other room in the building and asked the folks running, uh, the, are, you, are you ready to vote or are, are you voting? Are you voting campaign? Who's leader sitting right there? Um, and uh, we were very pleased to hear, because we are partisan Democrats, that, uh, <laughs> you couldn't that, tell, I'm sure. That, uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, you know, voter registration seems to be going very well on campus, and civic millennials continue to express an interest in participation. We'll know that answer. We'll determine the answer to your question next year. And, I, I just, uh, and um, you know, keep in mind that 16 million more eligible millennials than there were in 08. So that even if you see a slight drop off in participation. In total, the absolute numbers are still daunting for the Republican Party. Right, and I will only say, and, and just as using that as a segue to try to do this quickly, uh, which is hard for me, but yes, because we're running out of time. Okay, but the Republicans know this. They know that this is a generation that's at least at this point is not on their side, and they will have to have to cope with it in some way. So there are some group of Republicans, like uh, President Hoover's great granddaughter who are writing and saying, this, we have to change. The Republican Party has to change. It particularly has to become more tolerant on social issues, or we'll never get this generation. And then there's the other side of it, which says, well, this is going to happen eventually, but we're going to make it difficult for young people to vote. We're going to change the voter registration laws. And, mm -hmm. and so yeah. we're going to make it difficult for them to vote. So, it, so at some point, the Republicans will have to face up to this, and we'll see what they do and how they do that. But okay. you're not tempering this at all with congressional elections, which... No, uh, the, the, you, can't com you can't compare midterm election turnouts, okay. which were overwhelmingly old, uh, even though millennials voted in about the right proportions. But that's a, that's a midterm special election thing, and as I said to somebody who used to be my friend, any scholar, any scholar worth his salt won't use those comparisons. So, uh, last question here, Andy. Thank you. Thank you. tonight. Um, so if you have more questions, uh, definitely pick it up and, and take And we'll be sitting there signing, so if we missed a question tonight, come by and talk. We'll be happy to answer. Yes, sir. Uh, You've been uh, very patient. Yes, but I, I really want to congratulate you guys on these two books. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. It's a really... I told you we should have called on them earlier. Yeah. Well, it's an amazing, <laughs> it's really an amazing uh, continuation of the work done by Strauss and Hall. Uh, which I think were probably the, one of the most significant books. Oh, absolutely. We totally written. agree. Now, I'm a um, program director for planning, policy, and public health at Rutgers. I am in charge of the undergraduate program in planning. I've been doing polling now of, I've been doing polling across the country for maybe 10 years or so, but it's visual polling. To try to find out what it is that people want in the character of their future environments. The extraordinary thing that we're starting to find is that the millennials have a distinctly different mm. vision mm. of what the future is going to be than the baby boomers did. Where the baby boomers can be characterized by the sprawl, pro-car, or what kind of what's going on downtown New Brunswick with it being really car-oriented, 
The millennials are completely different. They are completely more for sustainability, more walking, more bicycling, more humanism in the context of the urban environment, more nature, more local food production. It is such a distinctive difference. Now, the kids are all frustrated. I call them kids because I'm 70. And I'm your <laughs> you age, by the way. I was surprised. You earned the, the, the right to do that. We weren't okay. millennials, but yes. that was really interesting. But what happens now with these kids is that they're frustrated that the things they want, they can't have. And they're essentially being restricted by the rules put into place by the baby boomers. Yes, exactly. So when this concurrence occurs in, what, 2015, when they yep. become equal to the baby yep. boomers? Yeah, yeah. We're going to see not only changes in the political structure, we're going to see major changes in zoning, master planning, environmental protection, as I can begin to read it. And I think you guys have just kind of expanded that horizon for me to go back to these undergraduates. So I, 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 I think it's more than political here. Oh, we the book is much more than political. We, we were at the Eagleton Institute of Politics, so we thought we might talk about politics. But yes, the book goes into all of those issues, and at the end of it, we conclude by letting the millennials speak for themselves. We use the Roosevelt Institute Campus Networks project that involves several thousand millennials trying to draft a vision for 2040 when they're in charge and used a lot of their words at, to, ex, to show our readers what this new world might look like and not take our word for it because by 2040 put in the ground. Okay, and, uh, and, and the, uh, uh, the thing you mentioned, healthcare, one of the things that struck us about that document, and it goes right to what you were just saying, is when, when they were asked to think about healthcare, they talked about healthy eating and local foods, right? Mm -hmm. And you go like, yeah, I don't think that's on the boomer agenda. I think we're passing a healthcare law top down, da da da, right? And so it is strikingly different, as you said, a strikingly different vision. Uh, thank you all very much for being so patient.